Hey everyone, today we're in eastern Oklahoma, more specifically Porham, Oklahoma, near Briartown, and we're here to visit one infamous outlaw, one that you've probably heard of. Her name is Belle Starr. But who is she? We're about to find out. So this really is a beautiful area of Oklahoma. Lots of greenery, trees, a little bit of hills. And then you get into lake country. This is Younger's Bend right here near the North Canadian River. And it's also near Lake Eufaula. But this is the infamous location where Younger's Bend is located. And there's even a sign designating some of the history here. Younger's Bend, formerly a strong southerly bend in the Canadian River, was located here. The course of the river was permanently changed after the construction of Lake Eufaula Dam in 1964. It is thought that the bend is named for Cole Younger, who served in the Civil War as a member of Quantrill's Raiders and operated in this area from 1862 to 1864. After the war, Cole Younger and his brothers would join Jesse and Frank James to form the James Younger Gang. Although visited by many other famous outlaws of the time, Younger's Bend is best known as the home of Sam and Bill Starr from 1880 to 1889. Both lived here until the separate events of their untimely deaths. It remains the quiet final resting place of Bill Starr. On the Canadian River, far from society, I hope to pass the remainder of my life in peace. Bell Star. This was erected in 2013. So this is the entrance to where you need to go on the trail to see Bell Star's grave. The final resting place is located here. Kind of just a neat little bridge here. And then this says, Younger's Bend, right there. The sign has fallen there. Last time I was here, that was chained up, so it is kind of broken. But, pretty interesting, there's a sign right here that you can't read. Right here, it says, enter at your own risk. And then down here, it says, Bell Star, at the base of that little stump there's a sign right here that says younger's been privately owned and maintained enter at your own risk closed at dark no hunting relics animals or anything and this is the neat little trail that you walk down bell star was born myra bell shirley in a log cabin outside of carthage missouri on february 5th 1848 her parents were Judge John Shirley and his third wife, Elizabeth Pennington. Eliza, as she was called, was on the Hatfield side of the feuding Hatfield and McCoy families. Bill had an older brother named John Allison, but went by the nickname Bud. She also had three younger brothers. Bill's father was a prominent businessman in Carthage, and the family was considered quite wealthy. Bell attended the Carthage Female Academy where she was not only taught the basics but also music and classical languages. She loved to play the piano but she also loved the outdoors. Her older brother Bud taught her how to ride a horse and how to handle a gun. Now when you come to this fork in the road right here, it's just kind of a T intersection, you want to go off to your left right here. If you go that way, there's actually a cabin. It's not Bell Star's cabin private property but it's a cabin that you might be able to rent or something and it looks like you can go off that way but don't go over here to your right when she was in her teens her privileged life changed dramatically when the Kansas Missouri border war broke out both armies passed through her area this eventually led to her brother Bud joining the Quantrill Raiders since he knew the area and the people well, he quickly rose to the rank of captain. He associated himself with the likes of Frank and Jesse James, as well as Cole Younger and his other brothers. In June of 1864, her brother Bud was killed by Union troops. This cemented the relationship between the Shirley family and the ex-Quantrill Raiders. 
the raids had taken a toll on Bell's family property and businesses. After the war, her father moved the family to a farm southeast of Dallas, Texas. Soon the James Younger gang robbed their first bank in Liberty, Missouri in 1866. They fled the area to Texas where they met up with the Shirley family. During this time period, Belle became reacquainted with the first man she ever loved, Jim Reed. Jim was another ex-Quanchel Raider and he was seeking refuge as well. Back in Missouri, the Reed and Shirley families had been good friends. So this is the final resting place for the infamous outlaw, Belle Starr. As you can see, she has sort of a spirit house style grave here, and there is a headstone there. We're going to take a look at that in just a moment, but I thought we would do a walk around just to kind of show you some things. Over on this side, you can see that there are carvings. Hopefully it's showing up in camera, on camera here, but there is the name Bell right here. There are all sorts of names carved in there, like Tyler, VB, and a box that's over here on this side. There's a lot of initials, a lot of carvings in this. They've even taken away portions of her final resting place, this little house structure. You can see where it's been chipped away there, chipped away in the back, chipped away in the corner here and here. All sorts of locations. You can see a Christmas topper up on top that is a star. Of course, that seems appropriate but there are all sorts of little chippings and carvings all the way around this there's even carvings on the back side here carvings on this side as well where people have carved their initials to say that they've visited i'm not sure if this said something originally um, that was more personal or not and you can see here that this border around here has little locations where you can place like a flower pot or maybe it had some sort of post stature around it um, i think that i have seen pictures where this had a fence around it to protect it at one time and it is no longer here you can see here this is round like it had a post big old rock here that seems almost out of place there's some flowers and a solar powered light there now, it's always interesting on these outlaws to see what kind of mementos have been left here but you can see lots of ponytail holders, pieces of metal, and of course, lots of coins. But the bullets are interesting. These are live rounds that have never been fired. 9mm, 357, 45, all sorts of rounds. Pieces of glass, leather bracelets, uh, fungal growths from trees, a butterfly. That looks like a fishing lure in a package there. Yeah, I see the hooks. And you can see a commemorative coin there, guitar pick, cigarette lighters, some more leather bracelets over on that side. Pretty interesting though. This uh, main marker right here was placed here by her daughter Pearl. And you can see a bell on the left side. And then a horse in the middle, which is her favorite horse, Venus. And then a star. So bell star and her horse Venus there. Says Bell Starr, born in Carthage, Missouri, February 5th, 1848, and died February 3rd, 1889. And it says Sheb there, I think they've got the D backwards, but shed not for the bitter tear, nor give the heart to vain regret. Tis but the casket that lies here, the gem that filled it sparkles not. And then you can see kind of a plant down at the bottom. Pretty neat little final resting place here. And I'm not sure why it's like this, but there are there's these signs here, which are nice that they're placed here. What I'm not sure about is what happened to the pictures. Did the photographs kind of disintegrate just with the elements because this doesn't have any kind of backing on it? Or did people take pieces of it for a memento? Or did the squirrels chew on the photo for some reason? Kind of looks like there's chewing here maybe by a squirrel, but then again, it could be souvenir takers. But that is an older photo here of the grave showing this particular direction there. There's also another one here that has the same exact problem with the photo missing. And uh, you can see the backside there, how there's no backing. 
but this is a photograph of this same uh, direction here. And if you look closely at this photo, and I'll show a better photo that's not a uh, missing part of it, but you can see part of a cabin, barn area. Her property was right there. This was in the front part of her yard of the cabin. So her property and the building structure would have been over this way. Now, there are no remnants of her property here whatsoever, at least that I can find. Tons of people throughout the years have been up through this area looking for the structure of her property, whether it's pieces of the building or the base of the structure, foundation, anything like that. And if they ever were here after they tore it down, then souvenir hunters would have ravaged it and picked it up right away. So I have scoured these woods before. I've been here several times and I've never found anything up through there. And I know that a lot of other people have in recent years have been up through here looking for pieces of the cabin and things like that. Maybe if you dug down deep, you could find it. But then again, this is private property. So even if you find something here, you cannot take it. And that includes taking pieces of the grave here. You can leave items here and that's fine. I think it's great that the property owner still allows people to visit and uh, leave mementos here for her. And you definitely don't want to destroy this for future generations to come see a piece of Oklahoma history and Old West history and Old West folklore with her dime store novels. When Jim and Belle decided to get married, the Shirley family had no objections. They married on November 1st, 1866 and lived on the Shirley family homestead where Jim helped with the chores. He eventually became a salesman for a saddle maker. In early 1868, Belle gave birth to her first child, Rosie Lee, which she referred to as Pearl. Now there are many people who believe that Pearl is the child of Cole Younger because he had been around her. However, Cole stated that he had not been around her when she became pregnant. This statement was backed up by Richard Reed, Belle's brother-in-law, who compiled a manuscript supporting Younger's story. In 1871, she gave birth to a son named James Edwin, whom they called Ed or Eddie. Eventually, Jim grew tired of the farming life and started associating himself with Cherokee Tom Starr and his gang. They were known for robbery, horse stealing, and bootlegging in the Indian Territory. In August of 1874, Jim was wanted for robbing and was killed by a lawman in Paris, Texas. Bell refused to identify his body, so it prevented them from collecting the reward money. She was left a widow at age 26 and living with her parents. In 1876, her father died. Bell then went to Indian Territory to live with Tom Starr and his family, who she had met while Jim was on the run and hiding with them. In June of 1880, Bell married Sam Starr, who was Thomas's son. Sam was 23 and Belle claimed she was 27, but in reality she was 32. Sam and Belle, along with her two kids, settled on his 62 acres on the north side of the Canadian River near Briartown. This area is called Younger's Bend and it is believed to be named in honor of Cole Younger, who the Shirley family was good friends with. There she continued to let old outlaws visit and stay with them. In one instance, Belle had Jesse James stay with them. She never told Sam who he was until after he left. She had only told him that it was an old family friend of her father's. In 1882, she was keeping horses on a neighbor's property and some of them were from nearby ranches. The neighbor confronted her on this, but she sold the horses anyway. Bell and Sam were charged in Judge Parker's court and both served nine months. Bell was a model prisoner, but Sam wasn't so much. After they returned to Younger's Bend, they continued hiding outlaws and selling goods, much of them stolen. It has been reported that she made enough money to pay any bill for anyone that worked for her. In 1886, Bill was charged for robbing a farmer near Younger's Bend. However, it was dismissed for lack of evidence. Three months later, she was charged for horse thieving. She mistakenly bought a horse that was stolen and gave it to a friend. She was found not guilty. Bell returned home after her last trial and found her husband seriously wounded by tribal police. Since Sam was Cherokee, he fell under the jurisdiction of the tribal council. 
She nursed him back to health and convinced him to turn himself in to Judge Parker's court. She thought he would stand a better chance there than he would under the tribal council. She paid his bail and got him the best lawyer in Fort Smith. His trial was set for February of 1887, but he was killed on December 17, 1886, by a tribal policeman. So once again, Bell was left a widow. And under tribal law, this left Bell in danger of losing her home and her land. Only a Cherokee or someone married to a Cherokee could own land there. So Bell married Sam's adoptive brother, Jim July. July was much younger than Bell, which caused resentment between her and him. Her daughter Pearl became pregnant against Bell's wishes and was sent to live with her grandmother in Arkansas to have the child. After the grandchild Flossie was born, Bell and Pearl even had more conflict when Pearl became involved in prostitution. Bell hired lawyers and tried to take custody of Flossie. At the same time, her son Ed was tried and convicted of horse stealing. He was sent to prison and Bell paid for lawyers and tried to get him a pardon. In a few months, she was actually successful and Ed returned to Younger's Bend. Now what happened next, there are differing stories as to what happened and why, but Bell for some reason used a bullwhip on Ed. This prompted Ed to move out and he expressed to others his strong resentment towards his mother. In 1888, Edgar Watson and his family moved to Indian Territory from Florida. He rented land from Bell. Bell caught wind that Watson was involved in a murder in Florida and was wanted there. He had paid cash for the land and Bell tried to return his money and that's when the trouble started. Watson refused to take the money. The tribal council had warned Bell previously that if she harbored any other criminals, she would lose her home and land. Resentment grew larger between the two because Watson refused to move. On February 2, 1889, Jim July was indicted for horse theft. Bell convinced him to turn himself in to Judge Parker's court in Fort Smith, just as she had done with Sam Starr. Now it is believed that she was on her way to Fort Smith with Jim July to pay for a lawyer and Bell. But about 12 miles or so from Younger's Bend, it is believed that they got into an argument for some reason. Bell told Jim she was going back home and not paying for a lawyer or Bell. On the way back, she crossed the Canadian River by ferry. A few hundred yards from the river and even closer to her house, someone shot Bell in the back and then another gunshot wound to the head and face. The man who operated the ferry, Milo Hoyt, heard the gunshots and ran to give her aid. He found her lying face down and her horse, Venus, had ran home. Pearl, Bell's daughter, had been living with Bell for the last several months and Pearl had also heard the gunshots. When she saw the horse with no rider on it, she went down the trail in search of her mother. According to Milo Hoyt, Bell died in Pearl's arms. Pearl and her neighbors buried Bell in the front yard very close to her cabin. Deputies found tracks near where she was shot and they also found tracks leading to the direction of Edgar Watson's place. When they went there, they discovered that his double-barrel shotgun had recently been fired. Jim July caught wind of his wife's murder via telegram. Pearl, Jim July, and deputies all demanded that Watson be arrested. So the deputies escorted Watson to Fort Smith, Arkansas. During the hearing, neighbors testified in favor of Watson. And it was discovered by authorities that Watson was not wanted for murder in Florida. With that, any motive that he might have had was now gone. Watson was released by Judge Parker, and upon his release, he contacted Marshall Hutchins and stated that Jim July had come by his house that afternoon that Bell was killed. He said Jim borrowed his shotgun, claiming that he wanted to shoot a wolf. This was when he was supposed to be on his way to Fort Smith. He later brought it back with both barrels fired. This was one hour or so before Watson even found out that Bell had been killed. The deputy told Judge Parker and he ordered him to investigate. When he interviewed Milo Hoyt, the ferry operator who had come to Bell's aid, he stated that Jim July offered him $100 to kill Bell. When he refused, Jim stated that he would kill the old hag himself. The two deputies caught up with Jim July the next morning and they ordered him to surrender and he refused. Jim was shot and seriously wounded after he drew his gun. The deputies took him to jail in Fort Smith, Arkansas. 
While there, his wounds grew worse. He asked for Deputy Hutchins, stating that he wanted to make a confession, but only to him. Before Hutchins could arrive, Jim July died from his wounds. Later on, in a book written by Flossie, Pearl's daughter, she stated that her mother's brother, Ed, was responsible for killing Bill. She also said that he was always jealous of her and Pearl's relationship. Now, there were many people that believed that Ed killed his mother, including some people that were outlaws. But her murder remains unsolved, and there's a bunch of theories out there as to what happened. But the fact remains that Belle Starr was killed two days before her 41st birthday. Belle became somewhat of a dime store novelty. Many things had been written on her and her exploits with outlaws and crimes, but hardly any of that is likely true. She probably did nothing more than steal horses and harbor criminals at her property. Nonetheless, because of the dime store novels, movies, and comics, she's a very big part of the Old West history. <laughs>